well tonight now I've, I've been talking about uh, I gave this really long exposition on the whole path of all the jhanas yesterday and this is a very general very general path it is one of the most commonly explained step-by-step uh, -step process of meditation that he taught and so it's very important for us to know this each of the steps and to be able to navigate this and orient ourselves so that we know where this meditation is going and where we're coming from where we are going and what is the actual destination this is always very eh, good to know where are we going with all of this and um, like it was said today it is really helpful to know these stages for self-confidence also because when we do meditate and we do go through these states uh, one by one and we get to understand that what we are experiencing is actually what we are supposed to experience and to have to have the Buddha saying this and then that we are experiencing it ourselves at the same time is very uh, powerful for our own confidence it's like a boost we we are empowered with faith and that's not blind faith it's faith that is based on our direct experience and this is where the this is partly what the sutta that I will be reading tonight is about how gradually we will gain this uplifted and unwavering understanding and it is sometimes called faith but there is a few kinds of faith and sometimes it gets misunderstood so I try to be careful using that word personally I think it's a beautiful word but sometimes people think that um, there might be some kind of uh, inclinations to uh, adhering to a particular kind of uh, faith or something or religion or something like this but the Buddha's teaching in this way in how we've been practicing and learning so far it is really not the intention and the faith that we are talking about is through our own direct experience of this meditation and our own happiness and the bliss of release that we experience and we can then understand that the Buddha in fact what he taught was true because we are living it and little by little drop by drop wholesome states after wholesome state we accumulate and the unwholesome ones uh, we let go and as this goes along the more this confidence will grow stronger because we will see yes that is true when unwholesome states uh, are given up then there is mental clarity there is mental happiness there is upliftment and this has repercussions in everything that we do in our lives directly and so from this big exposition on the path yesterday which is very essential but also everybody is at different levels so we we only take this as a roadmap that we use to navigate in our meditation And wherever you are, you can use this roadmap skillfully. 
And now from this big road map, we will try to see with the sutta, how does this actually integrate? How does this work in actual life? And this is what this talk is about, that meditation is not just sitting meditation. So far, We've been talking a lot about meditation, but really the word bhavana, which we is used also as is translated in English as meditation, truly means mental development. And this is not just sitting, this is all the time. And the sutta is quite wonderful to explain this and that this practice is a life practice. Life is the practice. And so we, we practice all the time, not only in meditation, sitting meditation. We go much deeper and we get to see quite wonderful aspects of the mind that perhaps we couldn't see well, we, that we couldn't see <laughs> if we were just engaged all the time in all these things. So we need this kind of insight deeper to, uh, to experience more release, more happiness. But then this is always connected. This always correlates with how we behave, how, how we are, how we live our lives. And so this is the analogy of the cloth. This is the mid-length sayings, number seven in the Majjhima Nikaya. And we will explore a little bit more about concretely what does this mean. Uh, in French there is this expression, qu'est-ce que ça mange en hiver? What does it eat in the winter? <laughs> That's, that's pretty concrete. <laughs> yes, that's all really nice, but <laughs> when everything is frozen and dead, <laughs> what, do, what do you eat? <laughs> so let's get down to earth again and um, get really uh, tangible with all of this. So I hope you like this sutta. This I have heard. Once the awakened one was living at Sawati in Jetta's Grove, at Anatta Pindika's monastery. There he addressed the monks, saying, Monks, Badhante, they replied. The awakened one said this, Monks, just as if a piece of cloth were stained and full of dirt, and a dyer would soak it in any kind of dye, whether it was blue or yellow or orange or red, it would look poorly dyed and dull in color. Why? Because of the dirtiness of the cloth. In the same way, monks, when the mind is soiled, a difficult life can be expected. Just as if a piece of cloth were clean and bright, and a dyer would soak it in any kind of dye, whether it was blue or yellow or orange or red, it would look well dyed and bright in color. Why is that? Because of the cleanliness of the cloth. In the same way, monks, when the mind is clear and bright, a happy life can be expected. And so this might come up to you at any time, uh, sometimes people wonder, why do we practice meditation? And in fact, this is a very, very common question that <laughs> meditators get <laughs> very often. So why do you do this? And uh, very often, meditation is considered as kind of a selfish practice because 
that's all good and well, but there are so many things, good things that you could do for helping others and all these things, but you're just sitting there in your room. <laughs> well, this can be explained in many ways, but to purify the mind, to clear and clean the mind so that it is rid of imperfections and by that we mean all these unwholesome states that are hurtful to us and to others. The Buddha with his wisdom said that this is the highest thing that we can do in fact because everything else that we will do afterward like we read every morning uh, the verses of the Dhammapada mind is chief mind is what comes before everything if the mind is pure everything is great there is happiness if the mind is impure then everything is difficult so this is what the Buddha is pointing us to again with this wonderful simile of the cloth and so when the mind is full of unwholesome states these states are not pleasant we we can be sure that our life will be difficult and when our lives are difficult the life of the people around us is also difficult that we like it or not we we live amongst people <laughs> and just being we are influencing and there are m so many ways that we do this and the best example is ourselves we are the man the makeup of everything that we lived in our childhood from growing up with our parents however that went <laughs> and <laughs> leaving home and experiencing life however that went <laughs> And having all kinds of experiences. And now we are the result of this experiment. And whatever way we have conditioned our mind so far, that is what we also give to others all the time. So if we have developed a forgiving, generous, compassionate, loving mind then things are things are bound to be good around us if we've developed uh, resistance armoring blocking off anger reactions then we can expect that things will be very difficult and very often we're just cocktail <laughs> and so here the Buddha explains what are the stains of the mind clinging to selfish desires is a stain of the mind impatience is a stain of the mind anger is a stain of the mind holding grudges is a stain of the mind Pretension is a stain of the mind. Retaliation is a stain of the mind. Jealousy is a stain of the mind. Selfishness is a stain of the mind. Deceit is a stain of the mind. Dishonesty is a stain of the mind. Obstinacy is a stain of the mind. Arrogance is a stain of the mind. Pride is a stain of the mind. Self-aggrandizement is a stain of the mind. Intoxication is a stain of the mind. And carelessness is a stain of the mind. These are a mere 16, <laughs> elaboration of 16 of them. And here we see the Buddha very often very commonly uses the template of the Four Noble Truths and this is the first knowing what creates us tension. Of course this is usually translated as 
suffering. <laughs> but this is, suffering is a very extreme word. It feels like we're all like searing in a hot pan or something. But really, <laughs> dukkha only also means, it means so many things. Like sukha means happiness, pleasant, uh, you know, all these words that we can use. Pali is very flexible in this, in this way. And dukkha is not just suffering. We need to kind of step out of that word a little bit to understand its, its, um, its closer meaning. And so how, how to understand and be able to integrate more of the teaching because it's really not just suffering. It's what is creating us problems or things that are unpleasant, like the dukkha. It's just not, not fun. <laughs> and these 16 things, this is the, f the start of wisdom, is to know this. If we don't know that these states will only bring us sorrow, will only bring us problems, these, none of these 16 states are going to be for your happiness. <laughs> that we can box in. And... Once we have this as information, which is really good, making things clear, and this is what the Buddha called having a straight view, we know that these states, they're not good for us. So, and here comes the second fold of this. Um, Sometimes the Buddha uses, very often, in fact, he also uses a shorter template of the Four Noble Truths. And he only says, uh, tension, this is how I translate it, or tension or what is unpleasant, to know that, what is unpleasant, and to let it go. So that's a bit more simple. <laughs> and this, this is what he also called the Four Noble Truths, but more in a simple way. And this is very uh, practical for us to know, to know what is causing us problems and to let that go. Of course, we can get fancy and talk about, well, how do we let that go? Well, we practice the path. Of course, that's how we let that go. And that's the Four Noble Truth. But in a nutshell, uh, this is how he explained it also very often. And this is what he called wisdom. To know what is causing us hurt and to let that go. When one understands that clinging to selfish desires, impatience, anger, holding grudges, pretension, retaliation, jealousy, selfishness, Deceit, dishonesty, obstinacy, arrogance, pride, self-aggrandizement, intoxication, carelessness are all stains of the mind. One lets it go. So that's the first step is to know this. And then once we understand this, well, we have everything that we need to let it go. Like when we touch a burning pan, for example, or... Uh, wood stove door and it's burning hot it's not a pleasant experience we move away it's the same thing but we call it in this teaching the four noble truths or wisdom well backing away from a red hot wood stove door is also wisdom so that's how it works at that time monks it is by understanding that clinging to selfish desires, impatience, anger, holding grudges, pretension, retaliation, and all the way down to carelessness are all stains of the mind. That is how it gets to be given up. A bit the same principle. So here we start with wise understanding all the time and on this path. We know what is causing us problems and then to let it go. And this, these were the Four Noble Truths. 
and also our practice, wise practice, right effort, is to take these Four Noble Truths and put them in, uh, in application. Then one arrives at this uplifted understanding about the Buddha. The Exalted One is a Narahant, perfectly all awakened, endowed with knowledge and conduct, living happily, knower of the world, unsurpassed guide for those who seek self-mastery, teacher of devas and humans, awakened and blessed. Now this uh, kind of skips a beat here. <laughs> you might think, well, we just talked about abandoning anger and now we're saying that the Buddha knows everything. But really, this is exactly what I started talking about in the introduction of this sutta, where slowly as we move away from all of these unwholesome states, what remains within is the path, is the Dhamma. And this is why this retreat is called Entering the Dhamma. Because when we leave these unwholesome states, we cultivate the path, we enter the Dhamma. And we are harmonizing with this. And the more we do this, the more we will understand what the Buddha taught and that it actually worked. Whether we experience uh, whatever it is that we're practicing right now, whether it's uh, forgiveness or metta or the higher jhanas or the very end of the path, slowly, incrementally, through our own direct experience, we will see and understand things that when these distractions come, they are hindrances to awareness and a clear mind. And the more we let them go, the more we become happy. One arrives at this joyful understanding about the Dhamma. The, the awakened one's teaching is well explained, directly visible, immediate, inviting, leading upwards to be experienced by the wise for oneself. It is well explained. This is, and as you notice, this is what we uh, heard this morning at the puja. These are the, the Buddha Vandana, the Dhamma Vandana, and the Sangha Vandana we are going through that arise through our experience of the Dhamma the good qualities of the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. And these come very often. And the, the Dhamma, the qualities, how the Dhamma was known to be, or how it is known to be, it is well explained. And this is in fact something that we can find a lot, a lot of people in fact are drawn to the Buddha's teaching because it is very clearly explained. And even people from other traditional uh, spiritual traditions say this about Buddhism. This is a very, uh, this is a very um, common uh, representation that the Buddha's teaching gets. It is very clearly explained, very step-by-step uh, step in many different ways and it really does make sense. There is not much um, uh, that is left up to uh, blind belief or anything like that. It all makes a lot of sense. Directly visible and immediate when there is anger arising, there is tension. We become all tensed. Face gets black. Our mind is overwhelmed by anger. It's not a pleasant feeling. We notice it, we let it go, we smile. Directly visible. <laughs> it's quite easy. <laughs> Immediate. There is no, it's not delayed in time. It's not, oh, you do so many prostrations and, and you will, you will exp experience uh, something 
at some point in a hundred lifetimes. No, it's here now. <laughs> and we're all experiencing it here and now. Inviting for the same reasons that I just said. Um, ehi pasiko. Inviting to come and see, to look. Because it is a pleasant practice. The more we let go of, the, of those unwholesome states, really the better our life gets. And that's just the plain fact. When we are devoted to this practice, and if we look, sometimes we understand things better when we compare to the opposite. So what if we were to not follow the virtues and lie and hurt living beings? How does that feel? <laughs> and uh, cheat and um, steal things it's a recipe for disaster but when we know clearly no hurting living beings I get full of remorse it's not pleasant I abandon this stealing same thing telling lies it all comes back to me after we tell one lie and then we have to tell a thousand more to cover up that one lie. It's always like that. And we, when we say the truth, well, sometimes it's hard. Of course we say the truth in a way that is not harmful as much as possible. It's not because you think someone's hat is not pretty that you have to tell them. <laughs> but you just... <laughs> that, not that kind of truth. But when you're asked... Uh, something and it might be hard sometimes to say the truth but when we stick to the truth truth comes back to us and that is that becomes our safety and that is how the Dhamma works it, it's always to help us really all of these things it's always to help us if we look at the opposite it becomes very clear the Buddha said monks have you ever heard someone that was fined or imprisoned or beaten up or executed because they refrain from hurting living beings? <laughs> the monk said, no, Bhante. <laughs> he said, good monks, me neither. <laughs> Usually it's the opposite. It's when people hurt living beings that they get imprisoned, jailed, fined or executed. They get in all these problems because why? He said, because that's the Dhamma. That's how things work. Monks, have you ever heard someone that was put in jail, beaten up or executed or fined for abstaining from telling lies? Monks said, no. He said, good monks, me neither. <laughs> and this, these, all these five virtues it's simply the Dhamma. When we, when we stay on that solid ground, it's a security for us. And so it's, this Dhamma is, is inviting because it's for always for our own good, for the good of others. You know, you're never going to do anything good for someone else by te lying to them. <laughs> it's just going to create confusion. That's never good. Why? Because it's the Dhamma. That's how things work. And what, what are we practicing? Letting go of anger, bringing up love. That's fairly good. <laughs> how are we supposed to practice? The opposite? No, that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Why? Well, it's the Dhamma. That's how it works. This is always for our own happiness. This is why it's inviting. Ehi pasiko, come and see. <laughs> Leading upwards. Well, again, same thing. If we abandon impatience, if we ab ab abandon jealousy, if we abandon uh, anger, if we abandon uh, all these 16 stains of the mind, we're bound to go upwards, and that's mental upwards. That is being uplifted in mind. This is an uplifting teaching. And that was the reputation of the Dhamma. It still is. To be experienced by the wise for oneself. 
though we have to be wise. And what does that mean? Is that sometimes quick gain here and now is tempting, but we have to be wise and we have to first know the Dhamma, know the path, and then we can better understand how to practice. But this is usually not so mainstream. It has, it has to be coming from wisdom. And nobody can force nobody else. That is also another beauti beautiful aspect of the Dhamma, is you have to practice for yourself. Nobody can enlighten somebody else. You have to do it. And that's why it's to be practiced by the wise for oneself. The Buddhas show the way. They help us tremendously, but in the end it's all up to us. One arrives at this joyful or uplifted understanding about the Sangha. Good is the practice of the Awakened One's Sangha. Straight is the practice of the Awakened One's Sangha. Wise is the practice of the Awakened One's Sangha. Meaningful is the practice of the Awakened One's Sangha. And for all these reasons that I just explained, now it, I believe it should be making it a little bit of sense here that we could say that anybody who practices this practices for goodness, practices a straight path, uju, and their practice is wise, abandoning anger, bringing up love, forgiving, helping each other, helping, giving, uh, practicing the virtues, and it is meaningful, it is meaningful and in Pali, there is this beautiful juxtaposition. Is that a word in English? <laughs> okay, good. Where there is this dual meaning to this one word, atta. And atta means both happiness and meaning. And this is quite a wonderful uh, definition, double definition to put, to have into one word because we really do realize in this teaching that and this is how we know this also with the loving kindness, we understand that wishing for all living beings, goodness, love. This directly, here and now, nourishes our own happiness. And this teaching is clearly showing us that to do good for others, to help others, is both giving us happiness the happiness of others is not something different from our own happiness. When we give, when we help, when we practice this path, this is the highest thing we can also do for others. Protecting them from ourselves. And when we do this, we align with happiness, but we also align with meaning. And this is something that comes up very often in people's life nowadays is this search for meaning. <laughs> search for meaning. Why? Why this life? Why? Why living? Well, this is the meaning here. It's not being selfish, helping others. And you will see, you will become very happy because that's just the nature of things. When we don't cling to things to ourselves, Yes, of course, we take what we need to live, of course. It's not self-deprivation, but we take what we need and we, we give exponentially. <laughs> we take that time to help as much as we can. And then we become very happy because we look at what we do and we cannot, we can only see that we've done everything good. We've tried our best. We've helped so many people hopefully, 
and this just gives us so much happiness and meaning so that is this little parallel here and so what is this sangha yadidang chattari puri sayugami yatta puri sapugala esa bhagavato savaka sangha that is the four pairs of people the eight kinds of persons and this is where um, we, I will be uh, explaining a little bit more about these uh, four kinds of people, eight individuals. <laughs> and this comes back very often in this teaching. Uh, there are four levels of, in Pali, this is called Ariya Pugala. Ariya was known to be, th these are the noble one, the noble people. I translate that as uh, simply the people that are awakened or that had undertaken the path to awakening. And they've, uh, they have their own particular qualities. And so there's four levels of awakening, I call it. Ariya Pugala. And these four levels are one, Sotapanna, stream enterer. These people have, there are a, uh, quite a few ways that we can describe these people. But usually it is through direct understanding, and this is linking back to yesterday's talk directly. Through direct understanding of the Dhamma, through direct experience and understanding of the Dhamma, one understands the Dhamma in such a way that they have this strong confidence in the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha, and virtue. So they understand these four factors that we call the four factors of stream entry. And the stream here is the stream of the Dhamma, the Eightfold Path. That is, when we start when we pick up, pick up the Eightfold Path and we practice it continuously, then we are practicing. We are slowly getting into the stream. But the more, and this is an elaboration, this sutta is an elaboration on entering the stream, basically. There, is the, there are these four qualities that arise through and this is a gradual process a gradual training as we practice this it gets stronger and stronger that confidence it's not blind faith not at all and there are three these um, these levels of awakening they are also correlated to the ten fetters now I know there's a lot of numbers but I'm just gonna have to cope with it a little bit <laughs> these are the basics of the buddha's teaching so i am uh, uh, simply uh, giving a few uh, very essential ones here and so these 10 fetters is what binds our mind to samsara and to the lower uh, planes up unto the higher planes and so this stream enterer Having these four factors or qualities of stream entry, of that confidence, fourfold confidence, they also let go of the first three fetters, the mental fetters, which is belief in a personal identity. Now, this is, uh, this might sound interesting, but uh, some people know already the Buddha's teaching uh, is about uh, impersonality, anatta, non-self. In the end, we are learning that this is this bodily, physical, mental process is simply a process that is conditioned by so many things from our past up until now. And these things, like some people have started to experience in their meditation, like the consciousness arising, 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 passing away, passing away. 
Who is doing this? It simply arises and it simply passes. It is conditioned. It is a force that was accumulated and we call it bhava. It comes from tanha, discontent or longing for something. And it's not that it's particularly bad, but it's particularly persistent. <laughs> and it gets very ingrained within us. And this is what we call uh, mental conditionings or later on samskaras, sankaras, impressions on the mind or mental processes that are built in. At this level, it's not a complete understanding because the arahants are the ones that completely understand this uh, with every mind moment. And we'll see this when I'll explain the arahants. But uh, at this level, we simply understand more theoretically that yes, there is an understanding that yes, these are all processes and everything is impermanent, everything is anicca not staying, not abiding, always moving, always flowing. There's nothing staying. Things are staying when we grab onto them. But the more we hold onto them, the more we create tension. And so we let that go. The second fetter that is abandoned is doubt. And this is also where these four, uh, that fourfold confidence uh, can be expanded is doubt in the teaching it's not doubt oh am i going to have a cup of coffee or a cup of tea this morning it's doubt in the teaching <laughs> it's doubt in the dhamma at this point we know the dhamma works we understand that it works we see it by our own direct experience and then the third is blind belief in observances and practices or in blind observances and practices so for example um, believing that uh, going to swim in a particular river will awaken you or um, to recite some kind of magical words will awaken you uh, and this we'll see in the, at the end of this sutta, the Buddha is, there's quite a beautiful story on this. Uh, how the Buddha's teaching is quite down to earth. We, we either have anger and abandon it, for example, or, or you don't. <laughs> and uh, this is what actually is the liberation. So there's true personality change and development. There is no, there's no blind dogmas involved. It's all very practical. And we slowly get to understand more and more of the Dharma. And we, for example, in the Buddha's teaching, for, for the first few hundred years, it was all oral tradition. So it has become, it always has been this uh, reciting a lot. Now it has become a lot more closer to chanting. But we recite these things to remember the teaching. So it is a different uh, perspective than uh, if, if someone were to recite these words thinking that they were magical, that they were going to awaken them. This is not our understanding of this here. This is... Uh, and that's why it's important when uh, reciting uh, the text that we actually understand what we're saying and uh, reciting, because that's the whole point of it, is to remember. So these three fetters are abandoned, personality view, doubt, and then blind beliefs and rites and rituals. I believe Goenkaji talks about it also in the 10 day retreat. Then we have non -return, uh, once returner. So a sotapanna, a stream enterer, is said that they only have seven more lifetimes to go in samsara. Whatever they do, they will reach full awakening uh, in seven more lifetimes or less. 
now they're the next level of awakening when we let go even further of unwholesome states uh, this is called uh, once returner uh, someone that will come back only once and make a complete end of tension and uh, attain full awakening and this can be uh, this is in the uh, Kama Loka so in the realms of the senses and I'm not gonna get into Buddhist cosmology but <laughs> We, um, this is part of the, the human realm is part of this. So, um, and these people, what differentiates them is that they have let go, and, and this is fairly vague, uh, of a lot or most of anger and longing for sensual desires. So, there is very, very little anger or ill will in these people. They are very, um, it still comes up once in a while. Like, uh, they might, some really rough situation, they might have this little bit of anger arising. It's short-lived, not, it doesn't get past beyond a certain state. It's mainly abolished, it's mainly put down, but it's still a little bit there. Same for longing for sensual uh, engagements. Like uh, there will be some, some, some kind of uh, preferences for food, for example, or some kind of uh, Some kind of uh, still desires for particular kind of activity or something like that. Uh, but the mental, the bliss of mental steadiness and clarity is becoming brighter and brighter and stronger. So there is no need, the need to go and find happiness somehow else or to that the possibility that we, that someone would react with anger and shake off that steadiness of mind is very slim, very slight. But it still can be. Then the next is anagami. The, this one was sakadagami, and the next is anagami. This person has completely cut off anger or ill will. It cannot arise anymore at all. So whatever happens, uh, there is no anger possible. So, and same for sen sense desires. So there's no, that person will eat to eat, to feed the body, to live, to live comfortably. We're not looking for pain or anything, but uh, this will, uh, the bliss of steadiness of mind is so, so present, so steady. There's no need for any of that there's no need to look for happiness into that there's only this blissful steadiness and everything else seems like a, a bit of a disturbance <laughs> so don't don't be scared it it takes uh it's not <laughs> it's all up to everybody and it doesn't happen right away it, it, it's all a, a gradual process a gradual training and some people sometimes wonder, well, I don't, I, don't, I don't know if I want to be that. <laughs> I don't know if I don't want to, you know, enjoy life and things like that. It's not that you can't enjoy life. In fact, that's, that's a wrong perspective. It's the complete opposite. You will enjoy everything. It's not because you don't look for it to happen, that you don't want it to happen, that you're not pursuing that, that it's not happening anyways. You, you will have situations where you, there's you know, your family, I don't know, maybe your family is going to the beach, you'll go to the beach. It's, it's fine. And you, you just basically, how I like to look at it is you're just having a good time all the time. <laughs> so that's, that's what it means. What could not having anger mean? 
<laughs> or impatience or any of that arising can you imagine not not ever it's not it's not even an option there is no and that means that pretty much means like worry and all these things it's the mind is so pure at that point and can you imagine living with someone that never gets angry that never gets impatient that never has any kind of bad intention it's just impossible just only good intention only can reply with love care compassion because because these states are really strong more and more they're they're the natural response of that kind of mind that's what happens when we let go of anger this what is the other option well this compassion love that's it that's this steadiness of mind joy and uh, when there is no sensual longing the mind is not it's not taken by that it's completely free of that so it, there's nothing getting it in the way of its happiness can you imagine living with somebody like that that doesn't need any of that doesn't get angry just replies with really good intention and the Buddha said in many places that this is actually the highest gift that we can give to people because whatever we're gonna do there's no real hurtful things that we can do or say well there might be but they're really not intentional and they are very rare they're very um, and it's really because of a certain karma that ripens up at a specific time but this karma fades away because it it doesn't have food it's not uh, it's not kindled it's not giving given attention or power and of course uh, sensory longing and ill will these are the the two fetters that complement the five that what we call the five worldly fetters the, the fetters of this pl plane of the senses and the anagami goes beyond this they when they pass away if they pass away as anagamis they non-returner they, they do not come back to this world they go to a higher plane this is called a, a, a special brahma loka a brahmic plane of existence where they will attain arahantship full awakening there with very favorable conditions because their mind is very clear and pure and the arahants now these are the the last ones the fully awakened people and these have let go of the five higher fetters we call them uh, longing for uh, rebirth in um, the form realms which is just above the sense realms rebirth for the formless these are the mental realms there's no kind of becoming desire for becoming anything more uh, higher or better or nothing this is all this is all uh, let go of and restlessness restlessness which is a higher fetter restlessness uh, this stays for a while this kind of hindrance will stay of course it will diminish but this is we have this one for a while <laughs> so yeah <laughs> we can start practicing forgiveness for it um, anytime now and um, and then conceit and this is where uh, this is the higher anatta the higher understanding of impersonality this is that conceit there that pride that is the the kind of the one of the last doors uh, to be uh, to be uh, opened and when when 
when there is this understanding directly, direct knowledge of anatta, that conceit dissipates and then there's no more ground for when when the ground of the self is uh, dissolved then there's no hindrances possible there's just a completely pure mind and this we're talking about the tenth fetter which is blindness or ignorance not seeing there is that kind of mind cannot become heedless. It is continually knowing. Not forcing, but simply there's no hindrance in the mind. So there's no restlessness, there's no conceit, there's just really good intention, really pure intention, really actions and actions rooted in this. So whatever karma is completely overcome, there is no more generating new karma. It's all, it's all done. It's all, there cannot be, at that point, all the past karma will just continue going until there is parinibbana, complete awakening, when the body uh, does its time and uh, uh, there is entry into parinibbana, final nibbana. And the eight kind of people, don't worry, this one is short. <laughs> the eight kind of people is simply these four, these four that I just explained, stream entry, once returner, non-returner, and fully awakened arahant. There are two, two steps to each of these. That's why there are eight in total. There's path and fruit, magga, pala. And Magga is someone who is training towards that state. And Palla, the fruit, is someone who is locked into that. They cannot, they're not on the path anymore. They're, they're settled into that, that attainment, what we call it. So this is the, a bit of the exposition in, uh, well, I want to say brief, maybe not so brief, but on the Arya Pugalas, the levels of awakening. And now you know a little bit more. The Buddha's teaching is not about complete awakening, thunder. It happens uh, in half a second during some kind of state in your meditation. It doesn't work like that. It is a gradual process, a gradual training. And we're all on this path right now. And this is what going into the stream means. Practices the Dhamma, practicing the Dhamma the Eightfold Path. And about this Sangha, this community of people, and the real Sangha is not just the robed Sangha. The real Sangha is these four people. Not... It doesn't matter who these people are, if they're wearing robes or not. And there were thousands of lay people, lay practitioners, householder, family people, from all kinds of places that were any of these four levels. Uh, well, the last, the Arahant, is it's a bit more tricky. We can talk about it at some point other, but uh, a, lot of, a lot of lay practitioners attained very lofty, wonderful, marvelous uh, achievements of liberation of the mind and when we speak about the Sangha at the time of the Buddha of course it was more natural there was so there was a lot of monks it was not so special at that time well it was but the divide in between the two was not that great and there was a lot of uh, communication between the two So very often it is associated with monks, but it is not uh, only about that. So it is open to everybody. And this Sangha of the Awakened One, and this is why we say this is, they are worthy of support, worthy of hospitality, worthy of generosity, worthy of respect, an unsurpassed field of goodness for the universe. 
this unsurpassed field, this Sangha was very often compared to a field where any seed that is planted is a very fertile soil because there is no unwholesome states, there is no greed. That we, the monks, we can't own anything. Even the food that we eat every day, we call it Sangha Dana. If there were uh, other monks here with me, for example, it wouldn't be just my food, it would be our food. Like we don't own anything. The, the, the robes that we wear, they are Sangha's property. The, the food that we eat, they are Sangha's property. So, there, and there's so many things that um, we cannot do, we cannot have, and this is for our own welfare and the welfare of many. But also when when the mind of anybody, whoever it is, a monk or a layperson, doesn't matter, who, who is just happy all the time, doesn't need anything. Well, whatever is given to these people, it bears great fruit because it, may, it goes a long way. It's not when we only take what we need to live and then the rest we just help others. I mean, how, how, much, how much more goodness could we generate than someone who doesn't, is just happy all the time with nothing <laughs> and doesn't need anything? If you give something to these, to these people, whoever they are, uh, it just goes until it, it really uh, um, it goes a long way. And also, it supports getting the Dhamma, uh, teaching the Dhamma, listening to the Dhamma, and getting, um, supporting this in a community, a materializing this, making this tangible. Um, and the Dhamma naturally spreads and how it spreads is by goodness, by generosity, by compassion. There's no other way to spread the Dhamma. It's not by me going around the street and telling people, oh, you should believe this, you should believe that. It's about goodness. The Dhamma is about goodness. And so, whenever something is given towards that, this is, this is why it's called... A, an unsurpassed field of goodness is because what is this teaching? Like I explained before, the virtues, abandoning anger, cultivating love. I mean, how how could it be better? <laughs> how could it be more fruitful than this? I don't know. Please tell me. <laughs> if you know, if you know something better, I want to know. But. <laughs> I haven't come upon it, so, okay, now I continue. <laughs> now, at this point, when one has given up, left behind, released, relaxed, and broke free from all of these unwholesome states, and that is the teaching, that is the practice right there through our own direct experience, one knows I experience this joyful understanding about the Buddha. Then one knows and experiences the meaning. Here's this word, atta. One knows and experiences the Dhamma. Knows and experiences the natural gladness of Dhamma. From that gladness, bliss arises in the mind. From that, bliss, that blissful mind, the body becomes calm. Calm in body, one experiences happiness. With a happy mind comes samadhi, mental collectedness, steadiness of mind, which is blissful. At that time when one has given up, left behind, released, relaxed, and broke free from these unwholesome states, one knows, I experience this joyful understanding of the Dhamma. Then one knows and experiences the meaning, knows and experiences the Dhamma, knows and experiences the natural gladness of Dhamma. 
from that gladness bliss arises in the mind from that blissful mind the body becomes calm calm in body one experiences happiness with a happy mind comes samadhi at that time when one has given up left behind released relaxed and broke free from all of these unwholesome states one understands I experience this joyful understanding of the Sangha, about the Sangha. Then one knows and experiences the meaning there and then, knows and experiences the Dhamma, knows and experiences the natural gladness of Dhamma. From that gladness, bliss arises in the mind. From that blissful mind, the body becomes calm. Calm in body, one experiences happiness. With a happy mind comes samadhi. At that time when one realizes, I have given up, left behind, released, relaxed, and broke free from all these unwholesome states, then one knows and experiences the meaning. See these fourfold things. Even when we let go, we experience the bliss, but also when we see the path that we've done from what we were, how we used to get angry and impatient and confused and all these things, and we look back, not only do we get bliss from the practice, but we also get very big happiness and bliss just by looking at the progress that was done and how much happier we are now. And this is not, it doesn't happen in one day. It happens over time and it gets stronger and stronger. Then one knows and experiences the meaning, knows and experiences the Dhamma, knows and experiences the natural gladness of Dhamma. From that gladness, bliss arises in the mind. From that blissful mind, the body becomes calm. Calm in body, one experiences happiness. With a happy mind comes samadhi. And I really like this sutta because it just keeps repeating the best sentence in the whole canon, which is how the mind gets collected by happiness and letting go. So it's to make sure that this is very well understood. If a monk of such virtue, or anybody, of such virtue, such dhamma, such wisdom, were to eat the finest hand-picked rice for alms with endless curry and dal, this would not impede him. Now, at that time, it was mainly rice and dal and curry, so the only fantasy that really could happen was if it was you know a better kind of rice or not so <laughs> the hand-picked rice here nowadays it's a bit more uh, uh, <laughs> luxurious or um, fantasy uh, fantastic or <laughs> however you want to say this just as a cloth which is stained and full of dirt becomes clean and bright with the, with the help of clear water. Just as gold becomes clear and bright from a smith's forge. If a monk of such virtue, such dhamma, and such wisdom were to eat the finest hand-picked rice for alms with endless curry and dal, this would not impede him or her. Then we have the Brahma Viharas as a practice to top it up. One meditates with a heart filled with boundless love, suffusing one direction, a second, a third, and a fourth, above, below, and everywhere across, to all living beings in this boundless universe. One meditates with a heart filled with boundless love, vast, expansive, measureless, free from anger and impatience. Then one meditates with a heart filled with boundless compassion, 
suffusing one direction, a second, a third, and a fourth, above, below, and everywhere, across, to all living beings in this boundless universe. One meditates with a heart filled with boundless compassion, vast, expansive, measureless, free from anger and impatience. And here I translate the word viharati as meditate, but viharati is the special, it means abiding, but in a special way, living in a special way. And this is the abiding of the Aryas, the way of living of the Aryas. This is not just meditating, I say meditating here, but is viharati is living, living in these states. One meditates with a heart filled with boundless joy, suffusing one direction, a second, a third, and a fourth, above, below, and everywhere across. To all living beings in this boundless universe, one meditates with a heart filled with boundless joy, vast, expansive, measureless, free from anger and impatience. Then one meditates with a heart filled with boundless calm, suffusing one direction, a second, a third, and a fourth, above, below, and everywhere across. To all living beings in this boundless universe, one meditates with a heart filled with boundless calm, vast, expansive, measureless, free from anger and impatience. Now going beyond concepts and the conceptual thinking. Now, this is another way that the Buddha explained how, how to practice the Brahma Viharas. He does not mention the jhanas here, but we talked about them yesterday. And we know that we can practice these, these jhanas with these Brahma Viharas. And we know that it works and how it works. The Buddha doesn't always repeat everything all the time. Of course, he explains his teaching in different ways. But now we, we know that there's, we know the sequence of the jhanas. Now he's talking about the Brahma Viharas, but we know how they match together. So we know a bit more how this process happens. And now he talks about going even beyond this, even beyond the Brahma Viharas. Then one understands there is this, there is the base, there is the sublime, and there is a release beyond this whole field of conceptual thinking. Now this is talking about Nibbana, complete Niroda, release of the mind. There is this, now with the Brahma Viharas we have very clear and sharp awareness because the mind is very, very pure. And we know we can better tell things apart. This is called discernment. The Brahma Viharas are a highway to wisdom. And there is the base, all of the hindrances, all of these unwholesome states. Now we've gone, we've gone way beyond them because we've seen with the Brahma Viharas as the highway to wholesomeness. <laughs> We see clearly these unwholesome states when they arise because they contrast very abruptly with this kind of wholesome mind. There is the sublime, the bliss of mental development, the bliss of the jhanas. And there is this re the release beyond this whole field of conceptual thinking, niroda, nibbana, knowing this is peaceful, this is sublime, namely the stilling of all conditioned processes, breaking free from all mental limitations, a complete calming of tension, appeasement, release, Nibbana. And this is the usual way Nibbana was explained, what that is. Continually observing and practicing and understanding in this way, one's mind gets to be released from the inclination for clinging outwardly, for the inclination to projecting in the future, and from the inclination to carelessness. In that release, one knows this is release. 
one directly knows unwholesome states have been overcome. Lived is the spiritual life. Done is what had to be done. There is no more conceit here. Monks, I say that this monk is cleansed by inner bathing. Now we loop back to the simile of the cloth where we clean this cloth and this is the inner cleaning. Now at this time, the Brahmana, the Brahmin, Sundarika Bharadvaja, was sitting near and said, Does the respected Gotama sometimes go to the Bahuka river to bathe? Then the Buddha replied, Why, Brahmin, go bathe in the Bahuka? What will the Bahuka river do? Dear Gotama, the Bahuka river is believed by most people to bring fortune to bring goodness, to bring merit. Most people go to the Bahuka River to wash away the unrighteous actions that they have committed. To this the Awakened One replied in verses, Bahuka and Adikaka, Gaya and Sundarika too, Sarasati and Payaga, and the river, the river Bahumati. The misguided may forever jump into without brushing off dark actions. What will the Sundarika do? What will the Payaga, what the Bahuka? They do not cleanse those who have done hurtful actions. Hateful men bent on harmful deeds. For those bright in heart, it is ever spring. For those bright in heart, the day is ever sacred. Those bright in heart, bright in actions, are ever practicing. Here, Brahmana, you should bathe and be a refuge for all living beings. And if you speak no lie, and if you, and if you harm not the living, if you take not what isn't yours, and if you be faithful and not selfish, what need you go to Gaia, when all the wells will be your Gaia? When this was said, Sundarika Bharadvaja said, Wonderful, dear Gotama, excellent. Just as if what had fallen over been set upright, or as what had been hidden was uncovered, or as if the way was shown to someone who was lost, or if a light was shown in the darkness, thinking, let those with vision see. In the same way, Bhante, the Awakened One has brought forth and elucidated the Dhamma in countless ways. Respected Gotama, I go to the Awakened One as a refuge, to the Dhamma and the Bhikkhu Sangha. I would like to go forth directly from Master Gotama. May I receive the higher ordination. Then the Brahmana Sundarika Bharadvaja received the going forth and received the higher ordination. Then the Venerable Bharadvaja, dwelling alone, secluded, attentive, intent, and resolute, in no long time attained the purpose for which Sons and daughters of good families honestly leave their home and become spiritual wanderers, seeking for the highest, the complete perfection of the holy life. And having realized the Dhamma by his own direct experience, he abided in it. He directly knew unwholesome states are vanquished. Lived is the holy life done is what had to be done. There is no more conceit here. And the Venerable Bharadvaja became one of the Arahants. This is how the Sutta ends. Yes. Bhante, can you um Tell me what comes under the category of anger. 
Is it a category? Or is it just anger? Or is it the jealousy and the conceit and the impatience and all the things as well? Yes. Well, good, good question. There's... So this, this word in Pali, Vyapada. Vyapada is having none of it. <laughs> having having none, none of it. <laughs> not, not having it. Vyapada, ill temper, not being... Um, this is very often called ill, ill will having a, a bad temper just a being um, there's the, there's the word aversion that's often used for it it's like vyapada was n not wanting it not not wanting it i personally i can't remember exactly what the word is in this sutta maybe it's a uh, koda which is another word for exactly for anger but um in my effort to translate the suttas, I always try to take words that are fairly meaningful to us in our practice and also daily life. Uh, like aversion is, 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 is true, but or ill will is also true. But uh, we, there's, we have very little to, um, to compare it with. Uh, in our own lives, whereas anger or impatience, uh, it becomes much more uh, easy <laughs> for us to find to find it. <laughs> so it's not this full fledged, um, you know, losing our minds and like shouting words and things like that all the time. But it can manifest in small things like being tired and something is not really going right and you just like bang your toe on the door sill or something and it's just like oh <laughs> that that thing that thing that arises instead of oh poor poor thing <laughs> oh having compassion so and then it doesn't have to be always you know like really crazy ultimate losing our heads um uh, but now to answer the other part of your question, these unwholesome states, like the wholesome ones, they help each other <laughs> and they come together. <laughs> so there is not always a clear cut line between them. You know, there's, a, for example, well, selfishness or pride, they're very, very close, anger. Anger is rooted in uh, pride. Me. Who's not liking it? <laughs> Ooh, <laughs> now it's getting tricky. Me. I don't like it. I don't want it. I'm not getting it. I'm not getting any of it. <laughs> I don't want your salad. So that's what <laughs> in in not in the literal way, in the <laughs> in the example way. I don't want I don't know if it's an English expression once again, but it is a French one. So <laughs> um and this you know this this these this pride what we say pride well it can be that boastful pride it can be this you know this going around thinking you're hot stuff or something or it can be the ground for also all of the unwholesome states which is the more subtle pride that i which is this thing that is creating us all these problems but we don't necessarily see who who's the who's that person not wanting it who, who who doesn't want it and who really wants it thing is that we it's not like we're thinking like oh me 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 but at the behind this 
the the ground for all of this is this personality view taking things very seriously about ourselves not seeing that these things are just arising and passing away in processes that are conditioned now the anger it can be understood as uh, everything that you could imagine I think that fits into that category uh, that we just mentioned is that close enough They help each other, they support each other, like the wholesome states too. Like we, for example, we, we might be cultivating metta, for example, but metta is, is wonderful, it's a garden of wholesomeness. And for example, uh, one of the reasons why is that there is, there is bliss, there is happiness, there is joy in love, there is joy in, there is happiness in love. And to wish this for all living beings is great, great happiness, joy. And that is a uh, support of awakening. And it is the factor of jhana. It is, you know, so we might think, oh, I'm just practicing metta. But that's not true. We're practicing many things when we're practicing metta. But we slowly get to learn this. And when we're practicing anger, well... We're practicing all kinds of things. <laughs> I remember hearing about um, verbal states or verbal being the way that things come out into the world there's three ways and um, so does anger always attach to the verbal well uh, in 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 the buddha's teaching we very often uh, hear of body speech and mind so that's the usually the, the three things that are um, the ground for all of our actions, basically. Um, actions of body, actions of speech, and actions of mind. It all starts from the mind, and then uh, very often it, um, speech is, um, in a few suttas, it is explained as not only breaking into speech, but thinking. <laughs> so thinking is speech really and um, these uh, these processes of speech um, wachi sankara they are thinking and reflection and so they are partly mental and then one, one thinks and then reflects and then one breaks into speech of course it is rooted in the mental but the mental Sankaras, the chitta sankaras, they are called uh, feeling and perception, or sensation and perception. And that's where the beginning is, really. There, there might, there are some seeds of, for example, of of anger, or impatience, there, and these seeds kind of grow a little bit into thoughts, and these thoughts they are they kind of get formulated uh, in the mind as words and these words break into speech and these speech well then when we really lack mindfulness they go into bodily actions unfortunately <laughs> but uh, hopefully we have enough mindfulness to refrain from that because that will be very hurtful to us in the third place <laughs> so I guess w you could say that you know before 
any actions take place bodily, there is some kind of intention and thinking. So we could say that uh, it flows into speech, not always verbal speech, but mental speech. Clear as mud. <laughs> good. That, that was a good question, actually. Let us share our merits and be happy. Dukkha patta chani dukkha, bhaya patta chani bhaya, sukha patta chani sukha. Hantu sabbe pi panino, irang no punyang sabbe satta numo dantu. Sabba Sampati Siddhya Aka Satta Chabhumatta Deva Naga Mahidika Punyang Tanga Numoditwa Chirang Rakhantu Buddha Sasasanang May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share these merits that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty powers, share these merits of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu.